used by E. coli's close cousin called Enterobacter orogenes. Now it's very hard to distinguish Enterobacter orogenes from E. coli. They look the same in a gram stain, they have many of the similar properties, they both ferment um, lactose. But <clears throat> the natural habitat of Enterobacter orogenes differs from E. coli. Enterobacter orogenes, it can be found in the intestinal tract, but it can also survive well in decaying organic material. Okay, so Enterobacter orogenes can be found just growing in decaying organic matter out in nature. So, if in a, a well water sample, we didn't find E. coli, we just found lots of Enterobacter orogenes, we're a little <coughs> less panicked. Because this might just represent soil contamination of the water, not fecal contamination. So the question is, well, how can we you know, distinguish these two? They, they're so similar. Well, we can use these different fermentation pathways to help distinguish them. And it turns out with the butane dial fermentation, we'll end up with an acidic pH, but it won't be below 4.4. Okay, so the pH, we'll just say the pH is between, like, yeah, I'll just make this up, let's say 4, 4.5 to 7. So it is acidic, but it's less acidic than um, the final pH of mixed acid fermentation. And it turns out this little bit higher pH um, causes the colonies of Enterobacteria orogenes to appear a little bit differently on the plates. They too will have dark colonies, but there's no metallic green sheen. Okay, and again on these plates, since they're a little bit old, this might not be too dramatic. Um, if you hold up the triplate, and the triplate means we have three different organisms on it, and um, if you hold it up to the light, you can see the E. coli has the darkest colonies, and then the E. coli, excuse me, the Enterobacter orogenes, which is um, the um, portion of the plate labeled as C, um, if you hold it up to the light, you can see it is dark, right? Not as dark as the E. coli. Um, and it's got, if you turn it over, you can see that it, it, it's appearing as kind of a dark pink color, but there's no metallic green sheen. Okay. So that is precipitation of the eosin methylene blue, but we don't get such dramatic precipitation that we get that metallic green sheen. Okay, so let me just show you here. Oh, excuse me. So in Professor Holland's photograph here, um, Enterobacter orogenes would appear as this central um, growth where we get a dark colony, but there's no metallic green sheen. That means lactose is being fermented, but the pH doesn't drop really, really low. Okay? And then finally in this photograph, an example of a lactose negative. For example, this could be salmonella is seen at, on the um, far left-hand corner. And you can see that they're growing, but they don't have the dark, uh, dark appearance that the lactose fermenters do. Now, I do understand you guys, it's pretty subtle. It's pretty subtle. Um, but we want to understand how the use of methylene blue permits us to differentiate between the lactose negative fermenters, where they grow, but there's no dark color. <coughs> These um, butane diol fermenters, such as Enterobacter orogenes, which will have a dark colony that lack metallic green. And then the ones that we really want to pay attention to, of course, of is the mixed acid fermenters, which could represent E. coli, dark colonies and metallic green sheen. Okay, so the yeast and methylene blue selects for the growth of Enterobacteriaceae and permits us to, to differentiate or distinguish between different groups of those bacteria. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I know that's the hardest one. The next one we're going to do is called mannitol sol auger, MSA auger. And I'll pass these out, and, and we're really short on these, you guys. Unfortunately, we only have like six. So it might be that we'll have to have a whole bench sharing these. Okay. So we'll, our next topic here is going to be MSA, mannitol salt auger. with your plates before you leave, would you just bring them back up and put them back in the little tubs because 
all the other laugh periods have to use them too. Okay, so let's take a look at mannitol salt auger, MSA auger. It's the one, it's the fourth medium in table two. And this is a, oh, thank heavens, it's not as complicated. That was the hardest one. Talk about the isomethylene blue. Okay, so mannitol salt is not going to be so hard. <coughs> Let's see. <here. coughs> is used to select for the growth of the genus Staphylococcus. Okay, so um, the genus Staphylococcus, um, the members of this genus have evolved to live in high salt environments on our skin. So I don't know if you, when you were growing up as little kids, like in the summer, if you're outside, you ever look at your skin, how does it taste? Salty. Salty, right? <laughs> From the sweat, evaporative cooling, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, salt, it turns out, is a powerful microbial inhibitor. Most bacteria can't grow in really high salt concentrations, but bacteria that have evolved to live on skin have evolved the ability to live in these high salt environments. So what we can do is we can add... Um, sodium chloride to MSA auger to inhibit the growth of most microbes but permit the growth of members of the genus Staphylococcus. Okay. So what would be the inhibitor you guys in MSA? So it's okay to read, read it off the table. Sodium chloride. Sodium chloride, right? Now on the lab practical, to get full credit, I want you to give me the percentage. 7.5. So 7.5%. And I want you to know what 7.5% means. Um, the 7.5% <clears throat> means weight per volume. And that means we have 7.5 grams of sodium chloride for every 100 mils of media. <clears throat> so if you guys wanted to make a liter of media, a liter of media, and you wanted it to have a final concentration of 7.5% sodium chloride. How much sodium chloride would you add? So if it's 7.5 grams for every 100 mils, so and we, we're going to have 10, 100 mils in a liter, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So how many grams of sodium chloride would you have? 75 grams, right? Okay, so that means 75 grams sodium chloride per liter. And you can ask that on the lab craft you guys. We can say you're, you're making like 500 mils of MSA. How much salt will you add? How much sodium chloride would you add? So make sure that you're feeling comfortable with that. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so that 7.5% sodium chloride, that's going to inhibit, stop the growth of most microbes and select or permit the growth of which group? Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus right? So it inhibitors, okay, and that's going to inhibit most microbes, and again, we're just trying to get used to those terms, you guys. The inhibitor is a substance that's added. Um, what, which group of microbes are inhibited? Okay, this is very general. Most microbes are inhibited, okay. And who selects for what? For who? Staphylococcus. Good. It selects for staphylococcus. Okay. Now, in a group, and you guys, if I fall over, I, as you probably guess, I'm a little bit sick and I'm very lightheaded. So if I topple, it's okay. I'm not having a heart attack or anything like that. I just, oh, yeah, my God. That's why I come here and go, whoa, wait, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have, we're going to select for the growth of Staphylococcus. <clears throat> and it turns out there's two species of Staphylococcus that we commonly find growing on our skin. <clears throat> hmm. So one of them is um, not a really aggressive, invasive bacterium, and it's called Staphylococcus, <coughs> Staphylococcus epidermidis. And epidermidis, that sounds like the outer layer of our skin, right? Epidermis. And this guy, you know, we usually consider it part of our normal microbiota. Usually it's, um, it doesn't cause serious infections. Um, 
it can in somebody that's immunocompromised. Okay, so you know it's like we want to respect it, but in normal folks that don't have serious compromised immune system or aren't severely burned, let's say, or something, usually it's not a problem. Okay, so we'll, we'll put here low virulence, low capacity to cause disease. Okay, but <clears throat> its cousin, its cousin is so aggressive. A highly, a potentially highly virulent organism. Who do you think the cousin is that we're so worried about? Staphylococcus aureus, right? Staphylococcus aureus, it makes so many substances that permit it to evade our tissue, to evade our immune responses. Staphylococcus aureus can cause serious, serious infections of any tissue, any organ in our body. So this one we're, we really want to watch out for. So in healthcare professions, it's important if you're if your patient develops say um, an abscess, some kind of skin infection, you really want to know is it Staphylococcus aureus or is it one of these left lesser pathogens? Um, and the reason is Staphylococcus aureus, as we said, is very aggressive. It can spread rapidly and it tends to be resistant to multiple antibiotics. So part of this is you need to know the identity so you can estimate ahead of time. If you're going to have multiple antibiotic resistance issues. Okay, so both these guys grow very happily on mannitol salt plate. So how can we differentiate them? And this is where the differential media of MSA comes in. So we can differentiate them in their ability to ferment mannitol. Mannitol is what's called a sugar alcohol. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna differentiate these two guys. Um, by using mannitol fermentation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sneak this in here. <clears throat> oh, is that how you spell mannitol? <clears throat> okay. Totally brain dead today, you guys. So, yeah, there's two. Yeah. Okay, so um, <coughs> mannitol salt auger is also differential because we can distinguish between um, Staphylococcus that can ferment mannitol, um, distinguish them from Staphylococcus that can't ferment mannitol. And it turns out that Staphylococcus epidermidis cannot ferment mannitol. So we, we could just call it mannitol negative. Okay. So as a consequence, the pH doesn't drop. The pH doesn't drop. Okay. Now there's a pH indicator in mannitol salt auger. And do you guys see in, let's see, one, two, three. Five. The fifth column over, what is a pH indicator? Phenol red. Phenol red, right? Now, phenol red is one that you probably know something about. Okay, so um, it, um, if we have staph, Staphylococcus epidermidis growing on mannitol salt, it can't ferment the sugar alcohol mannitol. So it turns to the proteins and does what to the proteins? Tears them apart. Okay, it's going to use the amino acids as a source of carbon and energy. What happens when an amino acid gets torn apart? The amino group gets released as what? As ammonia, right? Yeah. And we know ammonia acts as a weak base, right? It can combine with hydrogen ions to make ammonium, right? So what's going to happen to the pH? Will it go up or down? It's going to go up, right? And what do we know about phenol red at alkaline pH? The alkaline pH seven. phenol red is which color? Red. red. Okay. So let's take a look at your mannitol salt plates. And can you guys find the plate that has staph? Wow, getting dizzy. Staphylococcus epidermidis growing on it. It's right there. Can you hold it up? Is it yellow or pink or fuchsia? You guys, it looks like you got the right ones. Everybody's got the right one. Can you guys hold it? Hold up your staph epis, okay? You see, now it's growing on that high salt mannitol salt. That because it can't ferment the mannitol, it's breaking down the proteins, amino acids. The pH goes up, and the phenol red is what color? The red or pink color, right? Okay, very good, you guys. Now, as you might guess, um, Staph aureus can ferment mannitol. Okay, so you would say this Staph aureus is mannitol positive. And just as we saw with the other sugars, um, mannitol, when it's fermented, it causes um, increase in hydrogen ions. What happens to the pH? Hydrogen ions go up. What happens to the pH? It goes down. It goes down, right? 
And what color is seeing all red then? That yellow. Yellow. Yeah. Yeah. yellow. So can you guys identify the staph aureus growing on the MSA plates by the color of the medium? Yeah, you nailed it, you guys. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? Okay, so that is the classic appearance of staph aureus growing on MSA plates. Yeah. Right, yeah, so, um, it, well, it depends on how much acid is being produced. So the phenol red is evenly distributed through the auger. So where the bacteria are growing, that's where they're fermenting the mannitol. So like yesterday, <coughs> only the auger around where the staff were growing was yellow, and it was red around the borders. But they've continued to grow now, so almost all of the medium is yellow now yeah, from acid production. Cool. Yeah. Isn't that kind of cool, you guys? <laughs> okay. All right. So, again, we want to make sure that we know um, the mannitol salt plate. So let me quiz you guys. If we have a station of mannitol salt, auger plates are there, and we ask you, what is the inhibitor in mannitol salt? What would you tell me? 7.5% sodium chloride. Good. What will be inhibited on mannitol salt plate? Most bacteria. Most microbes. Right. Most microbes, right. Okay. What do we select for with mannitol salt water? Staphylococcus. Staphylococcus. Dynamite, you guys. That's excellent. Okay. Um, um, let's say we have a, let's say we do have a staph aureus cause abscess. So we take a sample of pus from the abscess, we streak Gross. it onto the plates, we incubate them. What color would you predict? the auger will be yellow. Oh, yellow. Yellow, right? And that's mm -hmm. from the mannitol fermentation. Mm -hmm. It um, causes a drop in the pH. The phenol then turns yellow. Good. And it, let's say it was, a, it was a Staphylococcus epidermidis. Okay. What color would the auger be? Red. Red. You, you nailed it, you guys. Okay. Now let me just do this really quick. I'm just going to sit down here. Um, on just, just to go back, just, you know, so we're getting this under our belt, you guys. So on ESN methylene blue, what are the inhibitors in ESN methylene blue? ESN Eosin and, and methylene blue. blue. Good. What is inhibited on EMB? Gram positive. Gram positive yeah. and non enteric. Gram negative. Non -enteric. Good. What is selected for an ESN methylene blue? Enterobacteria. Enterobacteria. Yeah. Okay. What if we had a salmonella growing on EMB? Can salmonella ferment? No. Yeah. no, they can't. So how would their colonies appear? Colorless, right? Mm -hmm. What if we had E. coli growing on EMB? Can E. coli ferment lactose? Yes. Yes. How would their colonies appear? Metallic green. Metallic green and dark. Good. You nailed it, you guys. Okay. Now, there's a, we had another meeting here, but because I'm getting dizzier and dizzier, I think we're going to wait, and we're going to talk about blood auger on, what's today? Tuesday. Thursday. Thursday, we're going to talk about blood <laughs> auger, okay? So I don't want you to be this way. This is really cool stuff, but I'm getting really dizzy, so I think we'll wait till Thursday to do that, okay? So we will do the blood auger on Thursday. Now, what we want to do is just finish up with a discussion of your airborne microplate. So I tell you what, why don't we, why don't we go grab our plates, and then we'll describe how you're going to count colonies, and then we'll describe how you're going to describe the colonies when you actually have your plates in your hands. That'll make more sense, won't it? Okay, so let's just take like five minutes, you guys. You want to go grab your airborne plates. <laughs>